First of all, I wanted to thank uh, Xander and Barb and, and the Southwest Fire Consortium for in, inviting me to uh, talk about this paper uh, that we worked on. Uh, so um, um, thanks for that. It, it's always great to pr uh, be able to uh, provide outreach and also have a dialogue with, with partners. Um, so to start off with, I just wanted to acknowledge um, that this was a joint effort between uh, the Nature Conservancy chapters in Arizona and New Mexico as well as with some colleagues at Northern Arizona University. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and, and get started. So I, I, I recognize some names on the list and also saw the survey results that we have a lot of folks from the Southwest. And so this may not be uh, news to a lot of folks, but this was really the starting point for, for why we decided to engage in this study. And this is sort of the fire, forest, water challenge that we face here in Arizona. Uh, so above the Phoenix metro area, there has been in recent uh, decades about 20% uh, mortality of the forests, the headwater forests, that in turn provide about 40% of the Phoenix metro area's water supply. Um, and then uh, included in this geography are the two largest wildfires in state history. Uh, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, research on this. and um, kind of a high-level summary that we came to is that essentially forests in this area and perhaps region uh, are experiencing a regional drying trend due to a combination of the factors that are listed at the bottom of the, of the screen. Uh, uh, warming, uh, um, which leads to enhanced drought, ap uh, enhanced drought impacts as well as uh, mortality, and enhanced fire activity, uh, size, intensity, and those sorts of things. And um, uh, the focus of this talk is actually on the last factor, uh, which is how to, how to improve forest conditions knowing that current, uh, current forests are um, uh, much denser than they um, were previously. And I'm going to describe that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, but what we found in our review of the literature in, in um, preparing this uh, paper is that Maybe this last topic, at least in the last several years, has received less attention in the scientific literature compared to um, the um, war warranted attention on warming and drought and fire. And, um, and yet, one observation we had is it's the one factor of these three that managers might have the most ability to influence. And so when we looked at uh, central and northern Arizona forests, um, and, and also New Mexico, um, forest conditions in, in these regions have, have declined uh, from, uh, from earlier parts of the century. So uh, here are some numbers for how sand densities have increased over, the, over that time period. And uh, basal areas as well have increased. They've, um, on average, um, uh, doubled since, um, um, since the ter turn of the century. And so the very basic question that we asked in our study is, is this question here at the top of this slide. Um, the four forest restoration initiative, or FORFRI as I will call it for, for the remainder of, of this uh, presentation, is an attempt to accelerate the pace of restoration across four national forests in Arizona. If you're not familiar with it, the uh, geography of those four national forests is shown in the highlighted green in, in the map. Uh, and in phase one of this um, project, which is, um, uh, which is ongoing or is actually going under review right now, um, almost 600,000 acres will be treated uh, over the next 10 years, including the type of thinning uh, treatments that are shown, shown with the pictures. And so I just wanted to give you a preview of the topics that I'll cover in this talk. This is, uh, you know, very sort of traditional format. Um, and I actually wanted to mention that I will spend some time describing the methods of our study uh, because understanding what we did and the assumptions that we made is going to be really important to understand our results. So I actually am going to spend a little bit of time on that. Please bear with me if, if that's not your belly wick, but I felt it was important to go over. Um, and as well, I'll share a few reflections on what we think uh, might be the important management implications of our study. So first, methods. Uh, 
So this is the geography of our, of our study. It is the salt and verity watersheds, the outlines of which are shown in this map. Uh, and within those watersheds, ponderosa pine forests, which are shown in green, and uh, the uh, four fry first analysis area within, um, uh, within these watersheds. So that's, those are the areas shown in red. Um, and, and so this is the, the geography that we chose for our study. Again, we wanted it to make it relevant both to these forests and to communities around these forests, as well as the downstream communities in the Phoenix metro area. And so one thing that I wanted to mention right off the bat about our study is that we adapted an empirically derived forest runoff model conducted in historical experiments uh, in the Beaver Creek sub-watersheds, which are actually within our study area. So I'll point those out here on the map. Uh, I actually just changed slides inadvertently. Bear with me. So uh, the, the Beaver Creek uh, sub-watersheds, um, starting in the 1950s, these uh, uh, studies used um, weirs, uh, including the one that is shown in, in the picture here, uh, to actually measure differences in runoff between paired watersheds, one that acted as a control and one uh, in which forest treatments were conducted, including thinning. And overall, these studies found, they went on for, for decades, and they found, uh, the experiments found a 15 to 40 percent increase in runoff on basalt soils was possible when basal areas were reduced by 30 to 100 percent. Um, and, and also very, uh, um, the, so the presumed mechanism for these increases in runoff were actually declines in evapotranspiration as forests became more open. Uh, another important finding of, of this research was that um, the researchers found that the effects of thinning were temporary, lasting for about six years, um, where presumably gains in, in flow, again from lower evapotranspiration were lost as understory vegetation regrew. Although on that particular mechanism, they, they did not measure that. That was just an assumption that they, that they made. And so in our study, we used scenario analysis. We used scenarios to estimate a range of runoff levels that would be reasonable to expect given uh, different assumptions and, and, and given variation in some driving factors. So one of the driving factors that we thought was really important is we wanted to look at, uh, we wanted to evaluate scale and how the number of acres that are thinned in a restoration project, the number of acres that are thinned every year, how all of that would affect runoff. So uh, one of the scenarios was taken straight from the planning of the four fry first analysis area, which uh, again will be completed in the next year. That is the area um, again in red in the map. And we also devised other scenarios assuming different uh, pace of thinning across ponderosa pine forest across the, the salt and verde watersheds, so that green band of ponderosa pine across the salt and verde, um, forests that were suitable to thinning. And I will define what I mean by this in, in just a few slides. We obtained stand level data from the Forest Service for the Four Fry First Analysis Area, so, so, um, and stand level information including prescription information, thinning prescription information. And so the histogram on the left part of this slide show uh, pre-treatment basal areas for the stands that um, will be thinned in the Four Fry Project and desired post-treatment basal areas on the bottom, all in acre feet. And so, um, completion of the project will lead to an average basal area reduction of about 50 percent, but there was a, a wider range of between a 30 and a 70 percent basal area reduction depending on the prescription. Um, so for the salt uh, verde scenarios, uh, we, we, don't, we didn't have the, um, specific stand, stand level information across uh, that larger uh, geography, so we extrapolated the four fry stand level data um, across, across forest, ponderosa pine forest and the salt verde, assuming that the conditions of the four fry stands were representative and proportional to, to all stands in the, in the two watersheds. 
this is a peek at the sort of fitting schedule uh, for the four fry analysis, uh, the four fry uh, restoration project that we put into uh, our first scenario. So uh, we found that almost 153,000 acres, again th those areas in red, would be thinned in, uh, in this case, all in the Verde watershed. Um, and we assumed that the acres would be thinned evenly across 10 years. So that amounted to about 16,000 uh, acres per year. Now these are sequential uh, treatments, one um, occurring every year for 10 years, and so uh, this pyramid on uh, the bottom right of the uh, uh, of the slide uh, gives you a sense of essentially how many acres are contributing to runoff gains across a 15-year period. So, uh, for example, in year one at the bottom left, that would be the first cohort of about 16,000 acres treated in the first year. Uh, the second year, one line up from that, uh, there would be contributions from that first cohort as well as contributions from a second cohort that was treated, et cetera, et cetera. And so each cohort, it, um, if you follow, let me see if I can uh, use another tool here. Uh, each cohort, um, its influence on runoff lasts for about six years uh, and then fades away after six years. Um, we ran our scenarios if there's um, the um, treatments ended after 10 years, but we ran our scenarios for 15 years, five additional years to account for the diminishing returns of, of runoff in those last five years. So that gives you a sense of how, uh, again, the contribution of acreage that um, um, will be important when you look at the runoff gains that we show uh, in the results. Back to the salt verde scale, in order to estimate runoff gains from thinning across salt and verde watersheds, we first had to estimate how many acres of ponderosa pine might be suitable for thinning. And so to do so, we adopted a methodology from a 2011 study conducted by Northern Arizona University in collaboration with some uh, forest, science, uh, forest service scientists that estimated wood supply in Northern Arizona after eliminating acres that are typically excluded from thinning due to steepness, restrictions in land management, recent treatments, and other factors. So compiling the best available GIS information, we estimated these factors for, uh, for uh, the, ge the geography of our study and we found, um, we estimated that uh, potentially 60% of the ponderosa pine forest and the salt verde could be thinned. This percentage compared favorably with the dozens of restoration projects that were reviewed in that 2011 wood supply study. Uh, but even so, we used this 60% as a high estimate and then included several scenarios with more moderate uh, total thinning uh, percentages. And uh, the next slide will show that in a little bit more detail. So this slide shows the varying scales and pace of thinning that we put into our four fry and salt verde runoff scenarios. The first uh, red rectangle highlights the thinning schedule for the four fry first analysis area that I started off with. And you can, again, see that, that pyramid to the right that shows the number of acres that are contributing to runoff across the scenarios. And um, the very last scenario shows the assumed 60% uh, as, as a high mark, 60% of um, acres in, the, in salt verde treated. Um, but the, the second, uh, or the uh, red rectangle on the bottom, shows what a thinning schedule for a more moderate um, uh, amount of acreage treated would look like. And again, what you can see is that the, uh, some of our salt verde runoff scenarios were much greater in terms of acreage treated than the four fry. Um, again, because we wanted to get a, a, a sense of how changing the scale would, would, would change runoff. The last factor that we varied in our scenarios was actually the one that the researchers in Beaver Creek found to be most important in explaining runoff, and that was winter precipitation. Uh, in this case, it's uh, winter precipitation more for the water year, so from October to April. 
And so using a PRISM model, which uh, many of you are probably familiar with, but for those of you who aren't, it takes, uh, it, it takes gauge information, precipitation gauge information, and uh, interpolates it across a, a larger surface so that you can know, you can get a sense of what's happening across, in this case, Ponderosa Pine Forest and the Salt Verde. Uh, using that model, um, screen is a little bit cut off on, on my screen. I'm not sure if that's how it's appearing to others. But essentially what we found in the last 100 years of, um, of data is that there's a lot of variation in winter precipitation in these watersheds. Um, and so knowing that the average winter precipitation does not accurately capture uh, what happens from year to year in these watersheds, we actually incorporated 15, 25, and 35 year sequences from this historic record um, and plugged them into our scenarios so that we could answer the question, what would be runoff gains if thinning occurred in a drought or a wet period that was similar to the 1950s drought or similar to the wet period beginning in the late 70s? And so this is the... Uh, this is our final uh, runoff model. It's a regression model, a statistical regression model. And it includes uh, the four explanatory variables that are shown. Uh, it was adapted from the original model that um, was developed during the Beaver Creek historical experiments. And it, count, it accounts for almost 70% of the variability in runoff crease, uh, increases that were measured, again, in those paired watersheds. One important thing. One important thing to note about our model is we designed it to predict increases in runoff from thinning treatments. So its output is an increase in runoff from, from treatments, not absolute amount of runoff. We did use the original Beaver Creek model to estimate absolute runoff so that we could then calculate percent increases in runoff due to thinning. And you'll see, you'll see, where, um, see those in the results in a second. And finally, we just wanted to show how the model uh, uh, behaves or how runoff behaves in terms of some of the explanatory variables. So in the model, runoff goes up with levels of winter precipitation as shown in the left-hand panel. In the middle panel, it, uh, runoff also goes up with reductions in basal area. And finally, in the right-hand panel, there's that relationship where uh, increases in runoff decline um, over time and uh, essentially reach zero after about six years from the initial treatment. So thanks for bearing with me uh, for those uh, methods and now we can get to the results of our study. The first result I'm showing here is for the four fry first analysis area and um, additional runoff is, um, is shown in acre feet on the y-axis in winter precipitation shown on the x-axis. Uh, so the symbols on the left, the group of symbols on the left of the graph, represent additional runoff that we estimated would occur in drought periods that were similar to those time periods shown in the legend. Uh, and the symbols on the right are um, additional runoff if thinning were to occur under wetter conditions. In general, what we found is that all scenarios led to about a 20% increase in runoff compared to unthinned forests in these headwater watersheds. And again, this included um, both conditions of drought and, and, and wetter conditions. Uh, the last thing I wanted to note with this slide is that the runoff, uh, if any were to occur in a wet period, was about double uh, runoff that would occur in a dry period. This slide shows the four fry runoff scenario in a different way, so where you can see the year-to-year -year increases in runoff across a 15-year period are not predictable at all and vary considerably from year to year. So let me walk you through these graphs to show you that. Uh, and, and these show um, the effects of four fry thinning in, under drought conditions. So the dark black bars on the bottom are winter precipitation levels, and the blue areas on the top left represent corresponding increases in runoff associated with the four fry thinning. So um, what I'd like you to see, see is that th there are some years where the blue is at zero. So there's essentially no runoff gains due to thinning simply because of very low winter precipitation. Uh, again, um, uh, this is a drought simulation. But also across a 15-year period, there are other years with above average precipitation. 
when we had actually looked at all the scenarios that we ran, we found that high precipitation levels in one out of three years resulted in about 75% of the gains in runoff that we were simulating. So these, these wet years uh, in, in, um, are, are really important uh, for these particular scenarios. And, and to us, this highlighted the importance of interannual variability that is driven by the El Nino and La Nina cycles here, here in the Southwest. This result gives you a sense of what we found with scale, and it shows that increasing the scale of thinning matters to runoff. In the left-hand panel, uh, acres thinned per year are increased in the x-axis, and you can see corresponding increases in runoff gains in the y-axis. In the right-hand panel, total acres thinned across a, a restoration program are increased on the x-axis, and again, corresponding increases in runoff gains are shown on the y-axis. And also you can see the differences uh, between runoff gains in a drought versus a pluvial or a, a wet period in each case. I'll show one more result here. And again, this is looking at results in a slightly different way in that these are looking at cumulative increases in runoff across a 15-year period. So um, the, the x-axis, again, are years, 15 years, uh, that we simulated. The y-axis are, in this case, not annual runoff, but cumulative runoff in acre feet. And uh, your eyes are probably drawn to the red areas. So the red areas are increases in runoff from thinning. And those are calculated as a difference in runoff in forest with no thinning. The dark blue line, again, we use the original regression equation to estimate those and forest with thinning, which is the light blue line uh, above, uh, above the blue line. Again, the difference is, is the red area. And, and um, these are from a 15-year salt verity uh, runoff scenario. Uh, the left panel representing runoff in a drought and the right panel um, in, in a, a wet period. Um, again, if you look just at the red areas, the absolute gains in runoff in a wet period, again, are more than double the gains in a drought. But the percent gains, given the same uh, um, climate conditions, are very similar. In a drought, it would be a 17% increase from unthinned forest. And in a wet period, it would be an 18% increase um, compared to unthinned forests. OK, I, I want to transition um, to something that's probably important to a lot of you. I saw that there are a lot of uh, managers and a lot of folks that work for federal and state agencies on the call, and so I'm, I'm glad to see that you joined. And, and we have a few thoughts on, on management implications of our study. Um, and our first result in terms of management implications is relatively simple. Um, you know, all other factors being equal, the more forests that you thin, the more runoff gains that you will, will accrue and um, potentially the more opportunities you'll have to use other tools to restore forests at scale if you, if you, if you do do this initial thinning at scale, which again the, the, the Four Fry uh, Restoration Project is attempting to do. This is a thumbnail. The bullets are a thumbnail of management objectives that are actually in the Four Fry Project. Again, these are very general and they have much more specific ones, but just to give you an idea for the flavor of the different sorts of values that they're looking to affect with their restoration project. Um, one observation we had when we looked at just the variability in winter precipitation, uh, again, for this geography, is that it sure may be easier or harder to reach any of these objectives simply depending on climate variability. So for example, our study showed differences in runoff gains, which is an important aspect of watershed condition. Uh, differences could be twofold uh, in, a, in a dry period versus a wet period. And that would obviously, some, that, that would obviously be something that would affect uh, management objectives. So the thought is that as any part of that as part of the adaptive management cycle, managers could take into account the best available information of climate variability to calibrate um, or even make their objectives contingent to, the, uh, to what's happening with climate um, during those years or during uh, uh, those decades. And there, there are um, prediction and uh, decision support tools that, um, that can facilitate this process. 
To us, the most surprising result of our study by far is that we found additional runoff from thinning may even occur in drought periods. Again, it's from the one to three years uh, in a drought period that still have above average precipitation. Uh, notably, the absolute gains in runoff during droughts would be modest compared to water demands of downstream users and was much less than occurred in wet periods. But nonetheless, uh, these gains may be essential for water-dependent wildlife in riparian areas in headwater, in, in headwater areas that are thinned. So for example, this is a picture of the Verde River where re researchers have projected declines in flow due to climate change, especially during droughts. So one observation is any additional water that can be provided to these systems under drought conditions could help moderate these effects. A few words on, the, uh, on sort of the limitations of our study. Um, again, th so what this slide gives you a sense of is that water benefits vary depending on your point of view from this thinning. They were most significant for the upper watersheds where thinning occurs. Uh, again, that's in the 20% range but much more modest downstream, simply because these watersheds are vast and all forests um, cannot be thinned in the same year. And, and also the runoff gains diminish uh, as forests re regrow. So like any science, there, there's more to learn and, and here, here are some other limitations of our study. So we developed or we modified a statistical model um, and um, because of that, the results cannot be applied for conditions outside the range of historical treatments. Um, plus, the model is statistical and it does not really attempt to measure physical processes. Uh, second, the historical experiments like Beaver Creek measured, you know, what's called in place or in situ runoff uh, um, in those weirs in the headwater forest. So more work needs to be done to understand um, flows in other parts of the water cycle or how thinning influences flows of other parts of the water cycle, especially evapotranspiration and groundwater recharge. Third, the Beaver Creek experiments were conducted on basalt soils, which cover about 60% of the Ponderosa Pine and the Salt Verde, but thinning effects on runoff in the other 40% of the soils in our geography, which are mostly sedimentary, um, thinning effects of, are, are not known on these soils, although there's some indication that absolute runoff on these soils is much less than, than basalt soils. Fourth, you know, we, we looked at 100 years of uh, winter precipitation variability in our runoff scenarios, and in so doing, we probably captured the high end of the wet period. Um, the, the turn of the 20th century was one of the wettest periods uh, in the long-term record, but the 20th century did not include a so-called mega drought that is also in the long-term record or a drought that can last up to 50 years. So that, that is a definite limitation of, of the method that we have employed. And finally, we don't, we don't know what the effect of maintenance treatments like prescribed fire uh, would be on maintaining, potentially maintaining these benefits over a longer time period. We will note that uh, there are maintenance treatments applied for, um, that are planned for all the acres in the four fry project, so this is a, a very relevant uh, research and, and management uh, topic. So the thought is, to the extent that these uh, prescribed fires can maintain open forest, um, then maybe the, the water gains that we showed uh, that are temporary in nature, maybe they could be sustained for longer periods of time. And actually our colleagues at Northern Arizona, Northern Arizona University have designed a pair of watershed study within the Four Fry Project uh, to um, to answer this question and and other questions on this on this list of uncertainties. So just to uh, conclude, I have just uh, one more remark here, which is that our study found, at least in the case of watershed health and runoff, accelerated forest thinning could improve forest resilience. Uh, it, accelerated thinning could increase runoff in headwater watersheds by 20%. Again, the benefits would be more modest for downstream use, users, potentially increasing the current municipal supply in Phoenix by 1% to 9%, depending on the assumptions that, in our scenarios, and overall flows in the Salt and Verde River by 1% to 3%. You know, our, our study was focused on runoff, but as we dug into the literature, we found emerging evidence summarized in, in the second list uh, that forest thinning can increase resilience in other ways in terms of essentially reducing drought stress and fire risk. Now some of these, most of these studies were done at the 
site specific scale or plot scale. Um, so more, more work needs to be done to, to see how these effects scale up or if they do scale up. But we uh, um, overall concluded that accelerated thinning is um, one way that we're thinking about it. It's a way to hit the reset button on ecosystem resilience in that it um, provides uh, perhaps immediate benefits for a number of resources, but it also opens up more opportunity, more management opportunities in the future. And as I and as I alluded to in the beginning, it's it's one of it's one of the only and perhaps most effective management options at our disposal to help these forests continue to provide benefits for people uh, and and also for wildlife. I. Um, we have one additional thought here, which is um, some of you may, may be thinking or, or uh, may have done research on this. There has been about a 20% decline in snowpack in the western U.S. in the last 50 years. About half of that is thought to be due to drought. About the, another half of that uh, might be due to warmer temperatures, especially in winter and spring months. And we simply note that uh, the, the, the percent decline in, in snowpack is similar to the percent increases in runoff. Uh, so that, again, maybe runoff, at least in the short term, could um, ameliorate or moderate the effects of, of warming. We tried to incorporate temperatures into our regression model, and they did not come, off, did not come out as um, significant, but we did find that spring temperatures in Ponderosa Pine Forest and Salt Verde did increase about 2 to 3 degrees Fahrenheit in, um, in recent decades. Uh, this last slide just shows you with the, um, uh, with the oval there um, where, you, where you can access our report if you would like to read it or get more information on that website, azconservation.org. And it's also available on the journal that we published on, that's, that's PLOS One. Um, please feel free to contact myself or Rob Marshall if you have any further questions and you can use the information shown on the slide. I just wanted to end to say that other chapters in the TNC are working on the connection between forest restoration and water in the West. So in New Mexico, um, there's an effort to establish a Rio Grande Water Fund, which is a financial vehicle to generate predictable funding for restoration treatments that protect and enhance services provided by forested watersheds. And that uh, a bill in the state legislature is currently um, being considered for that effort. And in California, our colleagues have just published a new report for the Sierra Nevadas where they focused on the potential economic benefits of thinning and found that the value of increased hydropower generation and water supply could cover between one-third and the full cost of thinning depending on a low and high water response. So with that, I will, um, I will pause and answer any questions that I can and, and uh, maybe I'll just end with uh, again saying thank you for your, for your interest. I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you so much, Marco. So that was a great presentation, and I appreciate that you uh, went through the methods because you're right, it is important, but I also appreciate that uh, you were gentle and, and uh, <coughs> gave us a good summary and not all the, the brutal details. So turning, we have some good questions here in the chat window. Uh, Joey Keeley says, uh, here in California, we spend a lot of time speaking to the increased groundwater recharge that occurs after thinning because of the much lower water use by trees. So he goes on to ask, if runoff also increases, what is the net benefit to the watershed, i.e. groundwater recharge generally results in longer runoff duration and extended base flow in streams? So I guess maybe, Marcos, if you want to talk a little bit about the connection or whether or not you looked at that, that groundwater piece. Great question, and um, so for the method that we used, it, it was essentially a, a surface runoff uh, relationship, and um, we, we thought about and looked into the groundwater aspect, but unfortunately didn't find any empirical data or even, or, or even models that um, um, could help with that, or, or that became sort of beyond the scope of what we're trying to do with this initial uh, report. But there is no doubt that um, thinning is probably going to have an impact on, on groundwater. And if it does increase, if it does lead to increases in groundwater recharge, we would ex expect that um, that would eventually be expressed in surface water uh, somewhere 
downslope uh, in the watersheds further further downslope, uh, and that would have a different signature in terms of when it would appear, what the lag effects would be, and and uh, it, it would have a different signature. Um, I think there is an NAU study where a PhD student looked at um, potential groundwater effects. I think they did apply a groundwater model, um, and don't hold my word to it, but I think they may have assumed that the uh, uh, the amount of increases in gain from surface water were going to be um, similar for groundwater recharge. And with that assumption, they ran it through a groundwater model to um, note what the effects might be uh, in reaches further downstream. Important question, but we don't really have, um, uh, we need to look more into that in, in these watersheds. Great, thank you. Uh, there's so many factors, it's hard to get them all. Um, and maybe this will fall in the same category. John Kelly asks about how the lower basal area works in forests with snowpack. Um, and I, there's some trade-offs there between uh, snow hitting the ground and, and shade and uh, increased uh, insulation, right? Yeah, and, and again, that's an important question we, that, we, that we did not fully address in our study. Again, we had a, a statistical relationship uh, with changes in basal area and how that might affect runoff, but it didn't really get into any sort of mechanisms or it didn't get into the, the, the structural changes uh, of the force in terms of size of patches, et cetera. Um, for, for another paper that we're working into, we have looked at how, uh, a little bit uh, into the research of how um, uh, forest structure affects, uh, affect, um, affects snowpack accumulation, and there's at least one study, I believe it was in um, New Mexico, mixed conifer, uh, that showed that um, I believe it was forests with sort of moderate densities had the uh, highest snowpack levels uh, um, uh, versus uh, forests with, with higher densities and forests that were um, uh, with lower densities are much more open. So that, that is another area that um, deserves to be looked at more closely. Great, great, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Richard Ab uh, Edwards. Are, you, are your target basal area, removal basal areas based on pre-settlement conditions or expected climactic conditions? The, um, the, the changes in basal area came directly from the Forfrey Restoration Project, uh, prescriptions from the Forfrey Restoration Project, and um, from stand to stand, they, those um, numbers were generated based on, on different objectives that were trying to be met, uh, uh, whether it was wildlife or watershed or uh, reducing fire risk. So there was a, a, a mix of objectives that were embedded in those um, in, in those. Um, uh, reductions in, in basal area. And uh, so for more reference on that, it would maybe be best to look at the actual four fry uh, restoration project. Okay, that's great. Um, and then Dick Cook asks, uh, or makes a comment that six years seems like a short time for the effect of thinning. Um, and he's wondering about information on the recruitment of seedlings that came back into the site. And I guess it's getting, to the point that in the original study, the original equations that you're using from the Beaver Creek, the uh, effects tapered off after six years, and um, is that because seedlings grew back in on the site and increased evapotranspiration back to previous levels, or are there other factors, grass growth or something like that? Yeah, again, it's an important question, and I think that the Beaver Creek experiments only touched on some possible mechanisms. You know, I should state that um, the Beaver Creek experiments, they only did the initial treatments. They didn't, and they only measured sort of differences in runoff. So they didn't measure, you know, evapotranspiration changes or they didn't measure vegetation changes after the initial treatment. And so we can only go on observations of some of the authors uh, that reported that uh, there was a lot of regrowth of actually understory species uh, or uh, perhaps, you know, uh, successional species like oak, like aspen. Um, I don't recall a mention of, of, of seedlings, uh, ponderosa pine seedlings and other seedlings, um, although I'm sure that could be a factor as well. And, and uh, I don't recall uh, information about grasses. The, the, the one factor that they did note was the uh, fast regrowth of, of these understory species that I mentioned. Great, thank you. 
Uh, Krista asks uh, or mentions that we are working with the National Groundwater Association to develop a one-day workshop in February focusing on the interactions of vegetation, surface water, and groundwater in the Sandia Mountains of New Mexico. And so uh, she's added a, uh, a contact address there. And Krista, I don't know if you have a website, but you could put that in as well, because I think um, as the current the slide we're looking at shows the Nature Conservancy is working across the country, and there are a lot of projects like the one that Krista mentioned. It's, it's a pretty important link. Uh, are there other questions out there? Feel free to type them in. I can also unmute the line in a moment. Um, and so if, if you are, if you do have background stuff going on, um, maybe you can mute your own line before I do. Um, uh, I guess uh, I wanted to ask, you mentioned briefly that there, there are a couple of ground or um, surface water runoff studies being implemented. Um, and you had a, an additional study on, on snowpack, if I'm remembering right. Do you have a sense of what the timing is on some of those? I mean, certainly for the runoff, that's, that's a long-term study, so we may not have answers from that NAU study for, for quite a long time. Is that right? And I'm um, taking a little bit of a liberty for speaking for my NAU colleagues. We're not, we're not directly involved in that effort, but my understanding is that they had some, or they're, they're hoping that some um, prescriptions uh, and, and, and some ability to do paired watershed experiments within the four fry restoration project will go will get through the review process and I think that they're actually still looking funding uh, for all the instrumentation that's going to be required on those paired watersheds but the idea is that it would occur for the four fry restoration projects for the first analysis area um, uh, again that 10-year period so uh, again, I think it's pending, pending funding and, and uh, um, um, environmental review. Uh, those results could, um, at least the initial results, could happen fairly soon. But again, the Beaver Creek experiments ran for 30 or 40 years, and um, the, 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 the synthesis or the uh, summary of all that collective knowledge was obviously not gained in the first couple of years. It, took, it actually took decades to understand all the um, uh, all the relationships, and I, uh, um, I presume that will be the, the case with uh, sort of modern-day uh, paired watershed experiments as well. Yeah. Okay. And the, the study you mentioned, um, you have a, a sort of follow-on paper that you're working on. Is that coming out um, in the near future? I wish we were done with it now, but we're still <laughs> struggling through it, and it, uh, I might have misstated myself. It's not, it's not focused on snow, snowpack directly, but what we've done is we've worked with a retired uh, USGS um, hydrologist uh, where he has a statistical way of removing the, um, um, the variability in, in monthly flows in the, in the salt watershed in this case that is due to precipitation. So we know that precipitation is really the primary driver of runoff on an annual basis and even on a monthly basis in these watersheds. He has a statistical method for pulling out that sort of uh, variability, that footprint from precipitation. And in that case, we um, can see uh, we've actually uh, early results from that study are showing that there have still been declines in summer flows due uh, in the salt watershed even when precipitation is removed. And we think that has something to do with uh, increasing basal areas in these forests in the past 100 years. Um, we also noted a shift to uh, actually more flows in February in recent decades, and we think that might have something to do with snowpack and warming temperatures. So it's a completely different method that is sort of teasing apart how these effects of both forests and, and, and warming might um, uh, might look across seasons and across uh, decades. Um, so it's a, a real good complement to this study, but it's, we're, we're still sort of several months off from completing that. Yeah, it's never easy to get these uh, articles out. Okay, I'll go ahead and unmute the line. Hopefully there won't be too much. So feel, feel free to speak up if you have other questions, um, or you can continue to type them in the chat window. Um, I guess one question while we're waiting I have is whether there's a um, 
the, the New Mexico folks here with the Rio Grande Water Fund um, feel like there's a direct applicability. I know one of the issues in the Rio Grande Water Fund is uh, trying to link the treatments as they go out on the ground to actual water for downstream users. Do you feel like your study can help make that link, or do we need a similar study in New Mexico? Whether there's a thought of similar restoration projects in New Mexico could have effects for downstream users um, based on our study, or whether an additional study would need to be conducted in New Mexico? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm wondering about um, the sort of transferability of the, the, your results to other locations, essentially, across the border here in New Mexico. Yeah, uh, uh, that's okay. So um, I would say in general, again, this is a statistical model, so you probably don't want to apply it to ponderosa pine in Oregon, for example. But the New Mexico ponderosa pine forests are pretty similar to, to, uh, to these Beaver Creek watersheds in Arizona. And um, I think some of our colleagues in New Mexico, the Nature Conservancy, were actually thinking of applying uh, these regression models to both ponderosa pine, and they were looking to uh, develop one for mixed conifer as well to see what the water yield effects of, of thinning prescriptions might be there. I, I don't know the current of that, uh, that effort, but I, I think for similar type forests, that have similar sort of uh, hydrology and climate that um, um, these results can be extrapolated somewhat, but um, once you leave the, the region or, or the forest type, then they're not, um, they're not really transferable. Great, great. I know that the same issue has also come up in the uh, Zuni Mountain Collaborative Landscape Restoration effort, um, so I think that, which is even closer, I mean, it's just across the line. So I, I, I think it is, it is great to have more examples out there to, to draw from. Uh, John also asked, which issue of uh, National Geographic did your map come from? And I, I think that was one of your early slides. Oh, no, there it is, yeah. But that's a good question. I, I don't, I, I actually don't know. It, I know it was a recent issue. Um, but I don't, um, I didn't record here the actual issue. So um, um, like all things, um, I actually found that with a pretty simple Google search, I imagine if you type in the right keywords, it would be one of the first images that pops up. Yeah, it's uh, hard to keep track of, of where these key things come from nowadays. Are there questions out there? Well, maybe um, we're coming up on the end of the hour anyway, so I want to take the opportunity to thank you again, Marco. It's a really excellent presentation, and, and even moreover, the, the scientific work that you put in uh, that you're drawing from for this presentation is, is really top-notch and I think a real service to all of us thinking about these issues and all of us who, who live in a parched southwest. So thank you very much. Thank you again, Xander, uh, and the Southwest Fire Consortium for the opportunity. Great. And um, as I mentioned, when I close out the webinar, um, your participants will be reject, redirected to a survey. Please do take a few minutes to fill that out, and the recording will be available soon. So thanks, everyone, for joining us, and I hope you can join us on future webinars. With that, I'll uh, close it off and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, Xander. Thanks, Marcos. Thank you.